Welcome back and today is 17 of September on a Saturday and time right now is 10.30pm Singapore Asia time and if you're watching from the US that will be 10.30am Eastern Standard Time. Welcome back, really happy to see all of you on this weekend and how's everybody? <laughs> so let me turn on the chat and let's pay my greetings to those who are turning in uh, tonight welcome back wow and i can see uh welcome to join us i see manfred kelvin jeffrey wilson isabella uh liz dizu good to see you uh bokwi jacqueline christopher eldin wow <laughs> so many of you on a saturday night and you can't fall asleep <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back and so happy to see all of you. Now, how's your uh how did you spend your time on this Saturday on a weekend? You know, my time has been uh pretty productive. Uh I was doing church work in the afternoon <laughs> and in the morning I was sleeping until very, very late because of uh yesterday night's uh market activities, and we're gonna go through them together, all right? So uh I'm also planning for tomorrow, which is uh, Sunday. Uh, tomorrow will be quite packed for me as well. And then planning for the rest of the week, uh, starting Monday to next Friday. So this is kind of the grind, the consistency, the boring laborious work that produced, uh, that will produce amazing, amazing amount of harvest. So I want you all to know there's consistency in the work that we do here and just like you guys, you know, making the effort to tune in consistently and just pick up the nuggets every single day in the market. All right. So thank you very, very much for joining me here uh, today. And welcome to Ivan, Adeline, Jeanette. Uh, I see Kinip, James, as well as uh, Ahusan. And what is a uh, 4K status? <laughs> Not too sure who's that. All right. So I'm going to switch over right now. Now, yesterday was uh, kind of uh, what we call the worst week since June uh, for S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. All right? I'm going to show you uh, how we go about interpretate, interpreting this. Oh, re recently, my tongue is kind of uh, getting stuck, you know. <laughs> the interpretation of this. Okay, let's make it easier for myself. And here we go. This was what was shown uh, yesterday. And of course, the one that is kind of uh, blindly, exceedingly loud and red is this piece of news right here. The stocks closed lower on Friday, extending a sell-off for worst week since June for S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. All right. So typically, uh, we can do the three uh, indices check. I want to always do on the Dow Jones first. All right. Now, if we talk about June, and the reason why it compared to June to right now is because back then in June, we have this really beautiful rally up here, right? This called a, uh, some, some of them call it the bear market rally. Uh, in, in fact, it's kind of sending out a wrong signal to us. And then we kind of a taper off. We went down again, all right? Now, what we really got to be concerned about is this guy touching 30,000 on the Dow. So let me give everybody a fresh fresh perspective uh, we're going to zoom out all the way to uh, bottom left 2020 and we can see this okay so this is becoming clearer and clearer each passing day that the formation right now is starting to take shape at the 30,000 uh, Dow Jones range now we have to have this ability to draw this horizontal line right uh, this is the line that we have to just keep monitoring, just have to fight our way through this uh, very, very tough season, uh, making sure that any any of the, what we call the tipping off, and we covered the tipping off yesterday when the newly appointed, I stress again, the newly appointed Fed, FedEx CEO, Subramaniam, Proclaim that the world has entered into recession. Damn it, man. <laughs> All right, so this guy, I mean, he cannot represent everybody. He's just giving an excuse for the ill performance of his company and then he cast the burden on the entire world. And because of him, kind of rattled the market yesterday, right? So for those of you who missed out on yesterday's live stream, please go and watch 
yesterday's YouTube when I speak and uh, kind of uh, poke into where could the potential weakness of what the FedEx boss is talking about. Really, I think he's just a new CEO, not, um, not performing really, really well on live CNBC and he was stuttering his way through and then just make a proclamation falling into the trap I call it a trap led by Jim Cramer because uh, I believe TV and media personalities are all in for clickbaits. They want sensational headlines and and then they blast it out across all social media and everybody start talking about it and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. All right. So this is exactly what happened yesterday and we are looking and monitoring this very, very dangerous point right here. That's for you the Dow Jones index at 30,000. And then, of course, we're going to look at S&P 500. Same time frame. We don't go and mess it around. And again, we go and draw our very, very important horizontal line. And for S&P 500, it will be the 37,000, the 3,750 line. $3,750 line, all right? So, again... If I kind of uh, zoom in this part here, you can see, right? That little guy kind of uh, is an arrow shooting up, not an arrow shooting down. I'm talking about this candle here, right? Because of uh, Subramanium kind of uh, freaking everybody out. So that's a 3750 for the S&P 500. And the third in, in this index is NDX. The NASDAQ 100, again, we got to draw our line. And the line is always, we haven't really touched the all-important line, which is the 11,000 line right there, right? So as I go on, go on through this tree in the search, you begin to discover uh, something similar about the three of them. Typically, they're always a bottom, bottom candle that touch the horizontal line. And then currently, it is right there, tapering about to touch the horizontal line. And this... It's going to play out on next Wednesday, all right? I, I want to prepare our audience for next Wednesday. It's going to be very, very tough because it's going to be the FOMC interest rate hike moment. This is very, very scary. Uh, I need to prepare you guys uh, because of a few factors. Number one, inflation has retained at a historical high from 9.1, dropped to 8.5, dropped to 8.3. And the latest reading at 8.3 is really not helping the case for which we believe the inflation has been contained successfully. But again, point number one, remember what is our takeaway? All the inflationary data that has been collated in the marketplace, they are lagging indicators. Uh, in fact, how, how lagging they were, you can think of it back then when why the government before the inflation shot up high and say, hey, inflation is under control. Back then, the blind side to justify transitory inflation because of the lagging data collection is going to be applied right now. Similarly, that everybody say that inflation is not in control, but actually inflation, the real, real inflation has already dropped. You get what I mean right now? The real, real inflation has really dropped, but the data is not dynamic data. It is a lagging data. So think again, why the government was so convinced back then we didn't have an inflation issue because they call it transitory because the data was behind time. Fast forward today, the, everybody's saying that inflation is out of control, but actually inflation is actually in control because of the lagging data. So you have this situation and um, how would you handle it as the Fed Chair Jerome Powell? You have been played out once and if you're going to get played out twice, holy moly, that's like double whammy, stupid, idiotic, nincompoot decision by them that's going to kind of uh, turn the whole economy upside down. All right, so uh, this is a conundrum we are kind of having this balancing act and um, we want to deal with this very topic tonight, all right? So a big welcome to uh, those of you who just joined in. Wow, Jacqueline is at Ho Chi Minh. I, I, 
I think I'll be visiting Ho Chi Minh soon. I supposed to visit <laughs> Hanoi, uh, but because my my father was not um, was hospitalized and I have to skip the trip. There was a wedding trip I supposed to make, and um, my good buddy from uh, Vietnam just contacted me and uh, perhaps you know there might be a trip planned for Vietnam. Wow, good to see you and hope to catch you in Ho Chi Minh, <laughs> Jacqueline. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest of you is just coming in. Okay, so have you found, have all of you found the most important article for today? And that's our YouTube challenge every, every single live stream. Go and find the most important article that will influence your thinking for today, each and every day. I give you some time to go and figure it out. And let me play some music and let me drink my Ta Hung Pao. <laughs> Wow. Okay, welcome back. Now I'm going to show you the article I found and, you know, we want to make it really, really productive and fruitful for everybody in each of the session we bring to you, all right? And I think this is uh, super, super important. So today I found an article which is really a good case study for us to learn and I think we're going to learn so much just on this article itself. Ready? Here we go. And it, go, it goes this way. This large cap fund is staying above water in this bear market by being the antithesis of ARC. Antithesis of ARC, all right? So for those of you who are not familiar, what exactly are we talking about the ARC? By the way, the ARC Innovation Fund was in fact... Uh, very inspired by biblical uh, uh, stories. And that's how uh, Katie Wood shared in one of her YouTube videos, all right? Uh, why she named it up? Because she received a calling from God that she wants to do really something different for her own hedge fund. So I'm going to switch over right now and take a look at the ARK Innovation Fund, ARKK ticker symbol. And here we go. And kind of uh, really interesting because I, uh, I had a meeting this on Friday uh, where one lady was telling me that she actually invested into the ARK fund. I say, what? Why would someone want to invest in an ETF? It doesn't make sense to me because for ETF, it's a collection or a basket of stocks. And typically, we rather invest in individual stocks to really know much more deeper about the individual stock and then to experience the capital appreciation. We strive to make 5 to 100% profit return in one day, all right? But this Art Innovation Fund has taken a really, really big beating. I mean, if I kind of uh, adjust the chart right here, uh, I'm trying to see where's the point. Okay, let me just adjust again. So at the highest peak, uh, it was trading at 160. All right, just take it as 160. And then it kind of a drop to the 42.58 today, all right? And uh, that's a drop of uh, 73%, 74%, all right? So uh, that, that, that is a drop of 74% for ARC Fund. And this drop, a few things for us to learn about this drop before we dive into the article itself, all right? So... First thing, we kind of capture the peak point here. But this peak right up there, there are two dimensions to this peak, which I think is important to give the credit where it's due, right? Because back then when the world collapsed under the, the start of the coronavirus, and which over time we right now call it COVID-19, our innovation fund went through a 45 degrees growth. Can you see that? This is really, really important. We cannot ignore this because uh, back then, if uh, it started from 30, let's just take it as $30, $30 to $160. That's how much it's gone, all right? So I take 160 divided by 30, it grown a 5.3x. This is like mama, mama. 
5.3x. Okay, so let's put it as 5.3x growth. Now, for a fund, especially an ETF to produce a 5.3x growth is like mind-boggling. It's like super, super amazing, right? It's not easy at all. And they've done it. As a result, for the year 2020, uh, KD Wood became the top number one hedge fund manager of the world. And a large part of it was a big contribution by Tesla. All right? During that period, Tesla kind of uh, gone crazy, did a stock split and boom, went all the way up. All right? Then the second side of this big peak is where it is right now kind of a deep down. All right? So, oops, hang on a minute. Let me just change this. It dipped down from the peak to the bottom where it is right now, uh, kind of a mirror image like this, all right? So, again, this is a drop of, um, you take one, six, zero, um, uh, uh, 42.42 divided by one, six, zero. That's a, a minus one. That's a 73% drop. So this is a 73% drop. Let me mark it out here. Uh, negative 73%. Right? So this drop, what constituted to this drop? We need to understand also. Before we dive into the article, I need you all to kind of appreciate what k has gone through. And perhaps there's some uh, big takeaway, big learning for us. All right? So negative 73% drop. Now, what I observed during that, that fall, in fact, you know, for us at Spiking, we kind of uh, really get involved in the data side of things, really work on the data for us as a fintech company. We say, okay, we really need to understand the portfolio breakdown of KT Woods. In fact, not just our Innovation Fund across the six ETFs. She owns about six. And then kind of uh, create a portfolio analysis to understand Okay, what exactly is a strategy? So if we kind of flip back over here, her strategy back then was really like this. As the stock price goes down, all right? I'm talking about really like a Zoom, Teladoc, <laughs> Roku. She just keep buying them. And that's called, that's why she, over time she's known as the queen of falling knives. As the stocks drop, she's keep buying them. And and last week, or actually this week, she was still buying Roku and Zoom. As the stock price hit an all-time low, she was still buying them. Big bout. Not your small change, it's like a few million dollars, all right? It's a big, big purchase. So this has been her discipline and her thesis despite all odds. Can you imagine, you know, right now, kind of a Wall Street quite a number of people are making fun of her, calling her all kind of nasty names. And in fact, somebody even came up with an ETF that is just to bet against Katie Wood. And that's called a suck fund. And really, I mean, the sound of it is just telling Katie Wood, you suck. But, you know, they put an S in front of the arc fund and they call it the suck fund. So the suck fund is to bet everything opposite of Katie Wood. And in fact, Kind of a suck fund is doing well, ironically, but you know, it's against the spirit. To me, I want to make it clear this is against the spirit because KT Wood represents innovation. And you know, she has been uh, at the forefront fighting, you know, left, right, center, uh, head and bottom, just to fight for innovative companies and give them the necessary boost through her participation in her ETF. And if anybody go out there and say that, hey, you know, I'm going to bet against you, you are betting against innovation, which is against the spirit. So, you know, uh, I feel that each one of us have, has, has our moral obligation to do the right thing. Now, of course, if you consider it purely from a mercenary perspective, pure mercenary, just pure profits perspective, yes, you go and support the suck fund. And I say you suck back big time. I will say that to you. Totally no reservation at all because that's against the spirit. The real, real spirit is, you know, for someone like Katie Wood 
she done well. Now, she done well, help so many people make money. Just because the fund right now is down, you throw stones, then uh, that is really, really bad spirit. Somehow, I always believe that karma will kind of uh, circle back. <laughs> you got to pay it forward, all right? So, we have a, a pretty good context in understanding what exactly uh, Katie Wood represents. And she's right now still very, very vocal. She's speaking all out loud, uh, you know, citing uh, Elon Musk calling for deflation uh, where prices are going down. And her data sources is already uh, front-running Fed or front-running the FOMC because everybody's working on their proprietary data. So for the team led by Katie Wood, she's telling everybody, hey, in the real, real ground, grassroots ground inflation, the price has already dropped. So she's calling out for deflation. Deflation means price has dropped. And Elon Musk, also, you know, the richest man in the world, has his own proprietary data sources. He's also calling out, hey, there's deflation right now. And if you go and continue raise interest rates, while on the ground there's a real deflation, you're going to boom, boom, double whammy, push the economy into a severe recession. That is the context of what everyone is saying, right? So I absorb that knowledge. And I feel that because of this context and, you know, ahead, planning ahead of next Wednesday, uh, the really, really psychotic, uh, <laughs> what other words can I describe? The valley of the shadow of death of the FOMC uh, interest rate hike meeting. That's coming on Wednesday. We got the thing ahead first and we work through the scenario planning so that as it happens, then we say, okay, we thought about it. Did we miss that? We considered it, and that's what I want to put all you guys through. But, you know, every now and then, I'll get feedback from different sources, right? And the different sources is telling me, teacher, what are you saying on YouTube? Very chim, you know. <laughs> For those of you who don't understand the language called chim, chim means it's like, oh, very advanced, very high level. I catch no ball. And I don't blame you. Because it takes effort. If it is so easy, everybody would have been doing it. And if it's so difficult, everybody else out there would have given up. But let me tell you, it's just that this is something new to you. I want to encourage you to apply your mind and tell yourself, I'm committed. I want to learn the art of investing. I want to become self-directed trader. And I want my own financial freedom. This is what this YouTube live stream is all about. All right. So, uh, so thank you all for your feedback. And somehow all of you know how to reach me in one way or another through our WhatsApp, through our social media, through emails and all that. And, you know, I'm just balancing, digesting all the different feedback and try to uh, put on the best uh, role model for, of you for you as your teacher and try to, you know, balance between those. I think we've got three camps here watching this uh, YouTube live stream, which is kind of challenging for me. We have one camp that's pure newbie. Uh, we call it the nope. <laughs> Not in a uh, condescending or insulting way. It's just that really you've got no idea what the heck is happening in the market. Then we have the other extreme right here. Some of you who call yourself the veterans of the market. Oh, I've been there, done that 10 years, 20 years. I got better torn scars, uh, whatever. But you know, for those that proclaim that you are the veteran of the market, and I just ask you one, I think I should ask you two questions to really qualify. Are you really the real, real veteran? Or not? Number one, are you aware of the fact that every day, their stocks spiking up 5 to 100% compared to yesterday's price versus today's opening price. There are stocks spiking up 5 to 100% every single day. Are you aware of, of this fact or not? So your answer can be either yes or no. If you say no, then straight away I disqualify you. You're not even a veteran. <laughs> then if you say yes, Teacher, I know 
Every day, there are stocks that are spiking 5 to 100% per day basis. Then my second follow-up question to you is, you know, then what did you do about it? You know, then what did you do about it? Which is what we are pursuing here as spiking. We are putting together all the resources that we ever have and ever going to have just to pursue this holy grail. Can I catch the spikes before they happen? This is what we represent. And then the third cl cluster of you, somewhere in between the nope and the veteran in between, every now and then you trade, and over time, especially this season, you feel very down and out. You feel that you're in the race. You feel that you're totally lost. You feel that you're suicidal. You feel that <laughs> you got... And by the way, you know, some of you may feel like a sense of stroke or heart attack. I want to talk about it openly. You know, I just received news that one of my classmates from Harvard Business School, uh, he, he suffered a mini heart attack. And then he was uh, going through operation and thank God, you know, the wife sent a message to all of us. He passed the surgery well. He just needs to rest. And this is realities of life. All right. If uh, for whatever reason, if you are caught somewhere in between, kind of totally confused, you put on a lot of pressure on yourself, you're going to have psychological and physiological outbursts. Your health will break down. So, you know, this is very, very real. Then that's the reason why, you know, I was just, uh, Nicole was just sharing with me, maybe we should start a SOS hotline. Uh, in uh, spiking. Just kind of uh, like a Samaritans of the world of investors. How can we help you? And if you need someone to talk, you just WhatsApp us and somebody, my angels will respond to you. You just need someone to share that, oh, you know, I feel very down and out about my portfolio. No problem. This is realities of life. I mean, you know, I want to show you the realities of life because Right over here, you are looking at the number one hedge fund manager of the year 2020 and today her portfolio is down 73%. Does it mean she's going to go suicidal? No. Does it mean she's wrong? No. Does it mean she's lousy? No. It's just that currently the market seasonality is like that. So don't take it too hard and don't blame yourself and kind of, uh, you know, feeling like down-spirited and all that. And that's one of the motivation why I started this 100-day stock market inspiration. Every day we go and find one great idea and fire off a trade, all right? So that's the reason why I'm doing this. And, and you know, Nico said it best. Yeah, let's do something to help those who kind of are uh, feeling very down at this, at this season. You can reach out to us very simple, sim uh, simply, uh, uh, we have not officially set up the hot hotline, but this is our hot hotline, all right? So let me give you the, uh, in case some of you are watching right now and you say, I, I cannot wait already. <laughs> then you can go to spi.ke uh, forward slash help, all right? This, uh, this, is the, this is our WhatsApp number and you can just drop, up, drop us a message, you know, uh, our angels will respond to you. I mean, you reach out to us just like just like you reaching out to any like Samaritans of Singapore or or any of the helpline out there. You just need someone to hear you out. Uh, that's what we're going to play the role on. Um, you need someone to respond to your WhatsApp. We can do that. But I want to set the expectation right. We may not be able to give you the right solution. And of course, if you are you are having some real suicidal thoughts, then we'll direct you to a list of a, a helpline that you can reach out to and call for help. But if you just want to talk about your portfolio, hey, how come my portfolio is not doing that well in the red ocean and all that, and just need someone to respond to you on WhatsApp, uh, we're going to mobilize our team to do that. So on Monday, we're going to have our level 10 meeting, and I'm going to share this as one of the rocks for this quarter. Okay, I hope that comfort you a lot. All right, we are still not done on our article yet. And um, 
If you like what we have shared so far, please let me know. Let me turn on the live live chat. Uh, let me know uh, if this is uh, helpful to you or not. All right. So helpful. And let me know on the uh, live chat. Let me drink some hot tea. <laughs> Wow, thank you very much for all the responses. I see uh, Isabella, Christopher, Dizu, uh, Jeanette, Kelvin, Manfred, uh, Bokyu, uh, Kinip. Yeah, so uh, that's the reason why we do this and that that is what drives us, all right? So thank you very much for your response and I see uh, Pua, thank you, and uh, Liz. <laughs> Liz, why your name is so different on the live stream? <laughs> and I see Elton, awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I think we're on the right track. We we can't, we want to kind of uh, formalize this on our website at spiking.com. We will be making some announcement on that. Okay, so thank you very much. Let's come back to our core topic of today. And we're going to dive in to study this article uh, really, really closely. All right, this is a great piece of article. We're going to learn so much. And here we go. And my style is, I, if, if it's a good article, I want to take my time to go through with you all, right? So I don't mind reading out to you. Uh, James Abbott expects that his fund distinguished itself this year by maintaining a traditional bottom-up perspective on stocks. The fund manager has maintained a stellar track record through his Center American Select Equity Fund, which he started in 2011, that is in the top 1% of funds in its large-cap blend cohort over the one-year, three-year, and five-year period. That performance garnered the DHA MX five stars from Morningstar. While small, the U.S. large-cap stock, large-cap growth fund is down just around 3% this year compared to an 18% loss in the category average, outpacing 99% of its peers in 2022, according to Morningstar. The real distinguishing characteristics of what we do, and in particular with the American Select Equity Fund, is that it's rooted in a very sound financial footing, looking at all aspects of a company in terms of capital investment that they make. We are the antithesis of ARC and basically momentum-based investing, he's added, we are the opposite. The flagship fund of Kediwood, ARC Invest, the ARC Innovation ETF is down 28% year-to-date. Abbott's focus on fundamentals as opposed to an approach tied to price momentum has led him to focus on companies with strong earnings, momentum, and pricing power in what he expected would be a resolve, rising interest rate environment. The fund manager maintains a concentrated portfolio of 35 to 50 of his best ideas. All right. Well, this is a, a very common practice, and I want to encourage those of you, you know, you are a subscriber of our Spiking Wealth Management platform. Go and look at every single fund manager. And typically, you know, we use Warren Buffett as the benchmark. He has less than 50 stocks. Uh, this guy has 35 to 50 stocks. Katie Wood is trimming off a portfolio as well, down to about 100 stocks. Uh, the bigger funds typically have about one, 2,000 stocks in their portfolio. Now, Bill Edmund has less than 12 stocks in his portfolio. All right, so if you're kind of a tailored to, towards this direction, then look for the fund manager on our software, those who are you know, having a portfolio less than 50 companies, go and make full use of them, all right? So I'm going to show you how to get a piece of data uh, right over here. And that is kind of uh, aligned with what we launched uh, really recently, and that's under investors, all right? Here we go. Let me just zoom this out and close off this, all right? Okay, so here we go. Dung. This is our software, and uh, I want to zoom it bigger, bigger, bigger. 
All right. So you can see we uh, launched something really new recently, and that is for every insider out there, we kind of uh, put this button here called copy. You can copy a uh, mirror trade any one of them right now today, all right? But which one to follow if we say you prefer to follow someone with a 35 to 50 stocks kind of a portfolio? There you go. This is the kind of data you want to see. Like for example, in one quarter, Warren Buffett is trading about less than 10 stocks. And the opposite of Warren Buffett is like uh, Nick Schumer is like, trading about 1,000 over stocks. Wow, that is heavy, heavy, right? So I go down the list and show you kind of uh, those with very, very few. And this is another one, Viking Global Investors, trading less than 50 stocks. Uh, Frank Sands, trading less than 50 stocks. These are the good candidates that you can just kind of uh, click the copy button and, you know, treat that as a signal. We will send a signal to you, right? And then you go down, you have uh, Christopher Horn, Less than 10 stocks, right? And I go down, we have a cow icon. Oh my God, less than five stocks. All right, so this is really nice. And then you have another one, gener Generation Investment Management, less than uh, 30 stocks. And uh, Felix Baker, less than 30 stocks. All right, so this is really, really clean. And you can see KT Wood has kind of uh, reduced, trying to cap below 100 different stocks, all right? And I can keep going down. We have uh, Moses Robert, Robert Moses, less than child stocks. Uh, John Amitraj, less than child stocks, and so on. So this is how you can make use of the data and, uh, you know, fulfilling that vision of what we call the concentrated portfolio of 35 to 50 of his best ideas, okay? So I left off just now over there, and this is how he made money. He's very concentrated in two sectors, which is aligned with what we've been doing this uh, one year. And we have a big focus on energy led by Warren Buffett. Uh, I've been tipping you guys off like, like crazy, crazy. We've been milking uh, Chevron, Occidental like crazy, including uh, ExxonMobil. All right, so uh, that's energy. Now for raw materials, we also talk about that during the war. We're talking about companies like Mosaic, um, uh, food related uh, that's because of the invasion of uh, Ukraine by Russia. So let's read really closely. A 24% allocation into energy, far greater than category weighting of just 4% in the sector, helped the fund ride the surge in oil and gas prices this year. So it's a very, very concentrated bet, kind of mirroring Warren Buffett. Now, Warren Buffett, in the past two years, each quarter, he didn't put in more than $1 billion. Q1 this year, he put in $40 billion, 40 act, bam, show hand. And he's still buying Occidental, right? So, uh, you know, I'm also learning really, really a lot what is holding me back to be even more concentrated than Warren Buffett. I keep asking myself this question. Uh, perhaps... You know, I was trying to strike out having a very balanced portfolio in my thesis. Maybe, you know, this is the season. I should not look at too many things, but really just focus on a few things. And it looks like this is the playbook for the season, all right? Very, very concentrated, just attacking that, that sector nonstop. And again, right, right over here, you can see this uh, beautiful line right here, all right? Major oil and gas companies in this fund include ExxonMobil, uh, Chevron, we traded on this too, as well as other firms such as hydrocarbon firm, EQT, and natural company range resources, all energy related. So that is where he, become, he becomes a specialist in energy. Now, then we think about uh, materials. So for materials, a 23% allocation of basic materials compared to the 2.7 average weighting boosted the portfolio. Investor highlighted chemical company Cotiva, as well as fertilizer stocks such as CF Industries and Mosaic. We traded on these two guys as some notable outperformers. All right, so again, you know, we are right, but perhaps we didn't go all out for a concentrated portfolios on this. They did well because 
I think they show hand right all their <laughs> their weightage is going heavy on energy and materials, right? So this is the breakdown, and again, it looks to me like very close to Warren Buffett, right? So like Apple is the number one portfolio under Warren Buffett, and but he's very conservative, five point nine one percent, but for Warren Buffett is forty percent. That's Apple standing in Warren Buffett's portfolio, forty percent of his wealth. And then he has this uh, mama stocks in his portfolio as well. And then this one is like, we've been trading non-stop action on this. Uh, the only question is how come he didn't have Occidental in his portfolio, right? That one I kind of a, kind of a curious. And of course he has, a, you know, these three guys here on materials, uh, Mozak, uh, CF Industries, Cotiva, and a strange guy that appeared here is Alibaba. I think this one, he was trying to follow uh, Charlie Munger, uh, Warren Buffett's partner. All right, so kind of look at it and, and I feel it. He was just uh, mirroring very close to Warren Buffett as the lead thesis. And the way this stupid writer, sorry I have to use this word stupid writer because sometimes, you know, they always frame the headline to be sensational as a clickbait. How can you use this word like antithesis of art? What has this got to do with Katie Woods? They bring in this statement just to get the clickbaits, all right? So uh, again, got to highlight it where, highlight those areas that are really not uh, comfortable with, all right? So let's continue. The fund manager said he expects that a lot of the easy money has now been made in the two sectors as investors may have mostly benefited from opportunity when it presented itself back in October 2020, still he believes there's still some upside to be had. The market is perhaps more balanced, but it's very difficult to see how with many people expecting things to just reverse back to the way they were, which is a disinflationary tech-driven world, the structural issues that are still embedded in most of the analysis that we are seeing is that this bear market, and it is a bear market, still needs to traverse quite a bit more. Okay? Very, very solemn message. I think it is what it is. And let's sum it up. The fund manager also incorporates hedging techniques, specifically put options from time to time to fortress the portfolio during periods of volatility, such as during the pandemic. This year, the fund had put, put options on the NASDAQ 100 at the start of the year, sensing a correction in the offing in tech stocks. And right now, it looks like he has a focus on healthcare. Regardless, the investor is, ch is changing tax somewhat to prepare for higher inflation for longer. Um, so this is the big debate. If inflation is going to stay longer, that means all the efforts by the Fed chair has gone wasted. No amount of interest rate hikes can tame inflation. And, you know, this is where everybody can take on different camps, all right? So uh, let me drink Chinese tea. <laughs> so let's understand what, he, what are his thoughts about inflation, right? Our expectation, regardless of the economic contraction or recession, is that inflation is going to remain much more persistent than people expect. Mainly because the supply side, that capital discipline that we talk about in most commodity producing companies and areas is something that's not well appreciated. And because the Fed Reserve can only destroy demand and not create new supply, it's very likely that we are in an environment that's more stagflationary than what people have experienced over the last 20 to 25 years. This is a new phenomena, stagflation, which kind of, um, I mean, uh, it's not a binary outcome. There's only three outcomes. Price going up is inflation. Price going down is deflation. Price going sideways is stagflation. So, you know, we have two camps right now, one betting for stagflation, one, another camp betting for deflation. Wow. Wow. The lagging data is still showing a high inflation, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a tricky situation. The fund manager said his, temp, his uh, tempered 
His exposure to materials over the past several months and has been profit-taking somewhat in the energy sector, though he has continued a preference for natural gas over liquids. ABIT has also substantially increased the fund's exposure to healthcare sector where the fund had previously been underweight, but particularly in established biotech names, Biogen, Gillette, Sciences and Mgen. To be sure, the fund does have one drawback highlighted by Morningstar, which is hefty, 1.46 expense ratio. All right. So let's, uh, we are about to finish on this article and this is the final part. He expects his success with his fund, which he started in 2006, mainly has to do with the key fact that he has managed money through multiple business cycles, whether it is true current COVID-19 pandemic, the 2008-9 mortgage crisis, the 9-11 attacks, and the dot-com bubble. Before founding Center Asset Management, started his career as a manager, da -da 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 -da. okay, that one is not related, and a bit expects that markets will continue to remain difficult for a while and urge investors to maintain a fundamental approach to markets as opposed to taking up what he calls fetish investments. This is adult swim time. I hope you enjoyed this article. I, I really uh, uh, enjoyed this article very, very much. Um, more about you know, gaining clarity on what he's thinking about and uh, the way he positioned his stocks. And, you know, it's kind of uh, prompted me to double check again, double, triple check the three funds that I'm monitoring very closely. Number one, Warren Buffett. Number two, Katie Wood. And number three, Tamase. And, you know, when I kind of uh, assemble them together, it points to the fact that, yes, energy is very much driven by Warren Buffett with his big bets, all right? Uh, right now, which is the next sector whereby you have elite investors who come in and to pump it up. Uh, I don't see... The reason why I'm still very uh, stubborn on KD Woods is because when you... When it comes to selling to investors to raise money, you always need a very sexy story. And what other sexy story can you get other than tech stocks, tech-related companies, all right? So, uh, so if you even think like uh, Masayoshi-san, uh, how he go about investing his money, he has made big bets on all the tech companies because those are sexy and easy for him to raise money, all right? Uh, you wouldn't want to raise the money to invest into something like very stable, oh my gosh, and uh, boring. Not easy to raise money that way. And that's the reason why tech will always have a bias for new money coming in. All right, so don't neglect that just because, you know, KD Wood Funds is not uh, doing that well this season of time. I really enjoyed this session with all of you. I hope you enjoy it as well. Time is running late. Tomorrow I got a, I got my duty in the church. I got to show up early, and I hope you enjoy tonight's session. Uh, by the way, if you want to know what trade I'm going to fire off tonight after going through this article, you can join me at the uh, Don't Stop Believing trade notification right over here, and of which I'm committed to kind of a fire a trade, one trade minimum one trade every day, regardless uh, Saturday or Sunday. Every day I'll be firing off one trade. And kind of, uh, you know, we push each other, we become sparring partners, and you enjoy uh, learning from YouTube as well. Most importantly, learning how to trade on your own accord. Thank you very much. I see you guys tomorrow. May God bless you. Goodbye, everybody.